Hello and welcome to Daily Prayer with for and from St Catherine's Church in Leesden at the end of a week in which we've been looking at the story of St Paul and in particular Paul's visit to Ephesus where things went very well until they went very wrong but hey we're talking about St Paul. Three years he was there, three years or was it two years? Ooh, I can't remember. Anyway quite a long time he was there and it was time to move on. He moved on around what we would now call Greece but he wanted to pop in again on his way back, but decided not to pop in again on his way back. And that's the story that we're going to look at today. It, I think it's a beautiful passage. I love this passage. It's moving. It is definitely a moving passage. We often think of Paul as being a, a rather a harsh character, uh, a man of hard words, uh, both in speech and in writing. And we don't feel very warmly about him, which is a shame. The people of Ephesus did. Join me for our opening prayer. And on to the reading. When we left Paul on Thursday, he was in Choas, <clears throat> saying a farewell speech, a very long farewell speech, a long farewell speech that went on all evening and all night and nearly killed somebody because it was so boring. Maybe it wasn't boring. No, just because it was warm that evening. I think that's how Luke justifies it. And he was a doctor. He should know. Anyway, we pick up the story from there. Paul left Choas. This is how he did it. We went ahead to the ship and set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul on board there, for he'd made this arrangement, intending to go by land himself. When he met us in Assos, we took him on board and we went to Mytilene, and we sailed from there, and on the following day we arrived opposite, opposite Chios. The next day we touched Samos, and the day after that we came to Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia. He was eager to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, he sent a message to Ephesus, asking the elders of the church to meet him. When they came to him, he said this to them. You yourselves know how I lived among you the entire time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears, enduring the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews. I didn't shrink from doing anything helpful, proclaiming the message to you, teaching you publicly and from house to house, as I testified both to Jews and to Greeks about repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus. And now, as a captive to the Spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and persecution is awaiting for me. But I don't count my life of any value to myself if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the good news of God's grace. And now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will ever see my face again. Therefore I declare to you this day that I'm not responsible for the blood of any of you, for I didn't shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God that he obtained with the blood of his own son. I know that after I've gone, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Some, even from your own group, will come distorting the truth in order to entice the disciples to follow them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years, there we go, three years, it was three years, that for three years I did not cease, night or day, to warn everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the message of his grace, the message that is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing, 
You yourselves know that I worked with my own hands to support myself and my companions. In all this, I have given you an example that by such work, you must support the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, for he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had finished speaking, he knelt down with them and they all prayed and there was much weeping among them all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, grieving especially because of what he'd said, that they would not see him again. And then they brought him to the ship. Please brace yourself for a shameless bit of self-advertising. Some years ago, I wrote this book, Oriel's Travels, which recounts Paul's travels from, well, the whole story of Paul in Acts from the moment when uh, we first join him at the stoning of Stephen all the way through to his arrival in Rome. And after that, we don't hear from him again. At the target I set myself when writing this book, and I needed this target to be met in writing this book, is that I wanted to come to love Paul. My main character, Oriel, the archangel who is supposedly writing it, that's his challenge. He doesn't like Paul at all, but he needs to learn to love Paul if he can really help him. And I found in spending a year writing this book and studying it that I did come to love Paul in a way that I never had loved him beforehand. And clearly the people of Ephesus, the leaders of Ephesus, had come to love Paul. There was much weeping among them all and they embraced Paul and kissed him. So what was it about this man which, excuse me, caused them to feel so fondly for him? One of the things that comes through is, is that he worked so hard. He worked so hard for them. He didn't just do what he had to do. He did very much more. He taught them at the synagogue. He taught them in the lecture hall. He taught them in their homes. He taught them wherever he had an opportunity to teach them because he had a message that he was passionate about and they could see that passion. Another reason that he loved them is that he, he took nothing from them. It was common in ancient Greco-Roman society for teachers, for lecturers to charge for their services. Paul didn't. He didn't charge. He, he self-funded. He, for, for those three years, not only funded himself, he funded his disciples as well. He made tents day and night in between all the teaching and the arguments and all that, and all that kind of stuff because he didn't want to be a burden on people. One of the things that comes through in his account is, is, is the number of times that tears get mentioned. Paul's message didn't come from his head. He wasn't a head teacher. He wasn't a teacher of facts. It absolutely came from his heart. And even though sometimes we struggle to understand Paul's letters, they come from his heart. And actually, if, you, if when you're reading Paul's letters, if you try to understand them with your heart rather than your head, then all of a sudden they make more sense. Because he's not trying to explain things actually in intellectual ways. He's trying to get across something that matters hugely to him. And that leads me to another point why I think they loved him. They loved him because he didn't impose his ways on them. Luke tells us that the reason Paul didn't go into Ephesus itself is that he was keen to get to Jerusalem for Passover. Paul was a Jew. Passover was a Jewish festival and Paul wanted to be in Jerusalem as a Jew for a Jewish festival and even though Paul was a passionate Jew he never imposed his Judaism on them. He didn't impose his religious traditions, his religious foibles on other people. Because he felt that that didn't matter because all of it, all of it is the gospel of grace. That's the thing that he's saying here. It's about turning to God. Repentance just means turning to God and trusting Jesus. That was what Paul felt passionately about. And they loved this man. They loved him dearly and he loved them. So thank you Paul, we're not leaving his story at this point. We've got more story to go which we'll pick up on another week. 
but let's just pause and see Paul from the point of view of the Ephesian elders because they were never going to see him again. And they were sad because he was a fantastic man. During the time of prayer, I've been pondering the issue of head and heart. I was saying how Paul was a passionate man, and he indeed was a passionate man. And that, that enabled other people to relate to him. But he was also an incredibly clever man. He was a highly trained intellectual, studied under one of the great teachers of ancient Judaism, Gamaliel the Great. And I think it's the coming together of both those, the head and the heart, which is the key thing. God made us both. God made us clever with big brains, but God also gave us an emotional system, which is phenomenally powerful. So both our head and our heart working together are us made in the image of God. So as we seek to do God's will, as we seek to, to be the people that God created us to be, we need to have our heads and our hearts both functioning properly and fully and in combination. Too much of one or the other can get us into trouble. Thy will be done. God made us with both. Join me in the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. That just about brings us to the end of our daily prayer for today and for this week as Paul sets off towards Jerusalem where, well, next time we pick up the Paul story, we will find out what happened as he made his way towards Jerusalem and what happened there. It changed his life, not necessarily for the better. Before we embark on that, before we leave for now, I just want to touch on one tiny little detail, which is possibly of no significance, but I love the tiny little details. And Luke, for whatever reason, decided to give us this piece of information. Uh, Luke and co set off from Troas by boat, but Paul decided to walk. I don't know why. They picked him up at, at Assos. And he got on the boat and went the rest of the journey with them. But for whatever reason, that first leg of the journey, he decided to walk. Maybe he'd eaten too much the night before and needed to work it off. I don't know. But it's a fascinating little detail. We will leave St Paul for now. We'll pick him up later. Join me in the prayer for grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen.